So why it's not anti-Semitic to criticise Israel? I feel like probably most people in here know the straightforward points, but what's really helpful is to hear them articulated, hopefully in ways that will help when you are faced with people arguing that point to you out in the world. So I'll try and talk about some basic arguments or I suppose assertions and then I'll try to back them up with a bit of history which is what we try to, to try to do here. Um, so just to set the scene in terms of where we are at the moment, um, International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan has applied for arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, and Israeli Defence Minister Yoav Gallant as well as three Hamas leaders. Uh, our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has said, just like Joe Biden has said, there's no equivalence uh, between Hamas and Israel. Um, and of course, we agree, but for different reasons. Um, and the no equivalence line has full bipartisan support with um, Peter Dutton, our opposition leader, saying only that Albanese hasn't gone far enough with um, arguing that the ICC arrest warrants are um, anti-Semitic. Um, and among Albanese's other statements, such as that he would not comment on court proceedings and calling for a two-state settlement, as he always does, Albanese also called the slogan, from the river to the sea, anti-Semitic. Um, as anyone is, who's in the movement for a pre free Palestine knows, what the slogan refers to is one state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, where people from all ethnic and religious backgrounds have equal and democratic rights. But there are lots of criticisms of Israel taking place now, and justifiably so. There are motions to boycott, divest and sanction Israel. There are pushes to cut the diplomatic ties that Israel has with other nations. Israel is really becoming a pariah state in the eyes of people around the world who previously would have either supported it or been relatively neutral on it uh, because of how it's treating the Palestinians and how that's really in everybody's faces in a way it has never been before. And of course, the unhinged attitudes of Netanyahu and his ministers is, is also on full display. And unfortunately, what seems to be a majority, continued majority support of the Israeli general population for those policies, of, of those genocidal policies. And at the same time, Israel is known as the Jewish state. And most citizens within the current borders of what is today known as the state of Israel are Jewish. So if that's the only information people have, they could be forgiven for believing the claims that criticism of Israel's are, by extension, automatically anti-Semitic. And there's several reasons why that's not the case. So I'm just going to list some points about this and then um, move on to a little bit of history. So firstly, anti-Semitism is by and large a form of prejudice, um, and it is a real one, with its roots in Europe. The worst form that this prejudice took led to pogroms or massacres and ultimately the Nazi Holocaust during World War II, which was a genocide carried out on an industrial scale. Since the Nakba in 1948, the Israeli state has inflicted its own genocide on Palestinian people. The Palestinian people were not responsible for the Nazi Holocaust of the mid 20th century, nor the pogroms in Tsarist Russia in the 1880s and beyond. So merely stating a fact that Israel is inflicting harm on a population without justification is, of course, not anti-Semitic. The second point is that people say criticising Israel is, or some people say criticising Israel is automatically criticising Jewish people because Israel is majority Jewish, uh, which, by the way, is now demographically also debatable. But the fact that, let's just say for the sake of argument, that Israel is a majority Jewish state, that's only the case because a uh, population that lived there before the Nakba was and continues to be ethnically cleansed in order to accommodate this Jewish majority. So it is not organically or by virtue of an existing mix of people, a majority Jewish state. It is that way because of a policy of settler colonialism by Europeans, supported first and foremost by the British at the time and eventually and crucially also by the United States. It is not anti-Semitic to criticise a settler colonial state that ferments its existence through extreme violence. A third point, and this is so obvious that sometimes we can overlook it when we're faced with this kind of argument. The state of Israel is a nation state. It is not a synagogue. It is not a community centre. It is not a collection that represents people from every religious, ethnic, linguistic, cultural Jewish heritage. Okay, it's a nation state. So to be anti-state is not to be anti-people of a certain religion. People can criticise Iran and not be Islamophobes. 
This seems like such an obvious point, but it still is one that sometimes needs to be made. Next, to uphold the belief that there is a need for the State of Israel and to maintain the willingness of its population to continue to be a citizen army, the State has to maintain their Hasbara or propaganda that Jews aren't safe when there isn't an Israel. By extension, advocating a removal of the State of Israel, uh, in other words, what the River to the Sea slogan advocates, which is a belief in a single secular democratic state that accommodates all ethnic and religious groups, that, that, that has to be asserted as being anti-Semitic or even a general, genocidal line to take by the propagandists. And it is not anti-Semitic to disagree in principle with an ethno-state. So that's a really clear and easy response as well. It's not anti-Semitic to disagree with an ethno-state and to agree in principle with the establishment of a secular state. So that, that's a really simple point that can be made. And then the last one that I'll say is that anti-Semitism is not on the rise because people are criticising Israel. That's a point that we sometimes hear from the sort of middle of the road perspectives, the ones that are sort of acknowledging that there's something bad happening in Gaza but aren't willing to concede that, um, that one side is really clearly oppressing another. Oh, I'm a bit afraid because anti-Semitism is on the rise because people are criticising Israel. Anti-Semitism is a right-wing ideology that can hook onto latent prejudices and misperceptions, such as that Jews rule over the capitalist class, own the media, have inherent traits that make us untrustworthy, and so on. That's an ideology that came from Europe, as I previously said. Now, where there is anti-Semitism among Palestinians or Muslims, and there can be, it is because their oppressors and colonisers in living memory have been the proud proponents of a Jewish ethnostate. That doesn't make anti-Semitism okay. All forms of prejudice based on ethnicity, religion, cultural language should be fought, but it also doesn't make it okay to excuse the oppression and colonisation. On the contrary, the more Jews who criticise Israel, the more it becomes possible for people who might hold such prejudices based on their experiences to separate the actions of a state from the people whose identities the state says that it represents. Jews who uncritically support Israel actually make things much worse and help to justify these notions that all Jews have this singular ideology and want to wipe out the Palestinians. Where Zionism claims to be the only thing that Jews can support, Zionists are themselves upholding a highly racist idea that people's political positions should be and are determined by their religious or ethnic status alone rather than by political ideas. So, just a little bit of history to give some of these points um, a bit more legs. Um, so the State of Israel was formed out of the ideology of Zionism, which began much, much earlier than the end of World War II, which is often what's cited by the State of Israel to justify its actions. Zionism was a form of Jewish nationalism that corresponded with both the rise of nationalism in general in late 1800s Europe and a response to violent oppression and anti-Semitism that had been promoted by uh, the ruling political classes and uh, empires and um, uh, especially in, in Eastern Europe at a particular point in history. However, Zionism was itself a ruling class ideology and was first promoted by a German group of wealthy Jews who tried to sell it to Jews all around Europe and eventually beyond. Zionists were keen on the establishment of a Jewish majority in historic Palestine. And since the British colonies around the Middle East were being broken down through a combination of colonial fights and independence struggles, uh, the British were very keen to have Europeans volunteer themselves to settle one of those locations. It was a perfect marriage. The Zionist ideology had already been able to build up an idea of a biblical connection between the Jews of Europe and this particular piece of land that had indigenous inhabitants through this idea that they could convince European Jews that they were returning. This is where the so-called right of return derives from, a right that any person anywhere in the world claiming a Jewish heritage, a very hazy concept in and of itself, uh, can go back to this place that neither they nor their family have ever been to. The thing was that the European Jews had nothing to do with this piece of land for generations and weren't particularly interested even when they were being appallingly oppressed in Europe itself. What they wanted to was to live free where they were and for their oppression to end. So in order to make this Zionist ideology a reality, the movement's leaders had to work very hard to convince Jews to emigrate from countries in Europe to colonise historic Palestine. And for the, for the first several decades of this, they weren't succeeding. 
European Jewish migration wasn't sufficient for the numbers required for colonisation because not that many European Jews wanted to go even after the horrible pogroms of the 1800s. Many European Jews had opted to emigrate instead to the United States, the United Kingdom and other countries around Europe before they could be convinced to go to a foreign land uh, that they had no connection to. And of course, a lot of Jews were also convinced that to be free where they were and to, uh, to overcome anti-Semitism and oppression, the solution was in fact socialism and international socialism where everybody would be in solidarity with oppressed groups and people who were exploited could stand up together against their bosses and the ruling classes who were clearly heading this kind of discrimination. So what the Zionists ended up needing to do was to convince Jews from other countries outside Europe, such as those that lived around the Middle East, to emigrate. And this was a very hard sell because life actually around the Middle East for the minority Jewish populations was pretty good by and large. Uh, but what happened was that before World War II, anti-Semitism started to get exported from Europe to countries into the Middle East. And so you had translations of German and Russian texts into Arabic to deliberately help spread these ideas that were entirely previously foreign to these regions because you had Jews and Christians and Muslims living uh, and coexisting, not in the abstract, but in reality, um, together and peacefully. And in 1941, there was an anti-Jewish pogrom in Iraq, but tellingly, unlike in Russia and in other parts of Europe, it was the first of its kind in hundreds of years of coexistence. So a very, very different situation. And what was ironic was that when many Jews did ultimately, many of them against their will, migrate from the Middle East to um, what eventually became Israel, uh, they faced extreme racism and discrimination uh, as Middle Eastern people and people of colour by the European population. And at the same time, they were incorporated into this citizen army and indoctrinated into the idea that it was them, all the Jews, even the ones who treated them poorly, who had a God-given right to be there at the expense of the indigenous population of Palestinians who stood in the way of settler colonialism. After the end of World War II, everything changed. The ideology of Zionism became popular among Jews in Europe as they perceived it, many of them, as the only option after the genocide of Jews, Roma people, disabled people and innumerable others during the Nazi Holocaust. The unwelcoming attitude of many countries around the world, including in the Anglophone West, to Jewish refugees really cemented this pessimism, as did the collapse of international socialism into, for example, socialism in one uh, un for one state under Stalin. And unfortunately, that version of socialism also saw a resurgence of anti-Semitism. So in the end, the circumstances led Jews in Europe to believe that anti-Semitism was a permanent problem and that there could only be one solution, which was a dedicated nation state for the Jewish people. The location that the Zionist movement ultimately landed on, there were, some of you may know about this, discussions about other places that sort of dissipated. Um, the location had an established population of people who were a religiously diverse group of Muslims, Christians, and a tiny minority of Jews. So these Jews of Palestine who did live there were very similar to the Jews of Iraq, the Jews of Morocco, the Jews of Iran, and so on. So the idea that there couldn't be Jews living today in a liberated Palestinian state should be dismissed um, outright. The aspiration of a state for European Jews played a special role for the Brits in their dwindling colonial status in the region, and today it plays just as special a role for the US, who needs it to maintain its military and economic stranglehold over the region. And of course, as we've witnessed, it's also in a special position for Australia, which is why Albanese is uh, part of the political and ruling class that sees the spread of successful activism in support of Palestinian resistance as such a threat at workplaces, in schools, at universities. Um, and while the US supplies Israel with money directly and with weapons directly, uh, and other countries do as well, Australia supplies equipment and parts, um, and it also has lots of diplomatic arrangements with the State of Israel. Um, just to name some examples, the Victorian state Labor government signed a $900 billion deal with Elbit Systems during the genocide, unbelievable, um, and that's the, an Israeli weapons manufacturer. The same government has also signed a memorandum of understanding with Israel. Uh, this is one I only learned about recently. Universities Australia has a mem memorandum on cooperation in higher education 
with the Association of University Heads in Israel to promote academic links and exchanges between the two countries. I'm not surprised that this kind of official arrangement exists given what universities do, but I am still somewhat shocked that it's so formalised. And then, of course, there's the satellite spy base, um, Pine Gap, on uh, Arente land just outside of Alice Springs, which played a decisive role for Israel's eventual victory of um, in the Yom Kippur War in 1973 because of feeding intelligence to uh, the Israeli army um, uh, when uh, the Egyptian army was, uh, was in the Sinai Desert. So, and today it's still got three of those satellites pointing directly at Gaza. That's, that's so our role is so direct. It's not, even, it's not even sort of just via the US, which I think people really need to understand. Um, Australia has a lot to win as well through this alliance due to its own militarisation and sub-imperial goals. The government has purchased nuclear submarines, has repressed independence struggles such as that of New Caledonia, and has reaffirmed relationships with the ethno-nationalist regime in India, and it's doing everything in its power to ready itself for war with China. So another answer to why it's not anti-Semitic to criticise Israel then is uh, that um, to say that it's anti-Semitic to criticise Israel is a ruse. What it actually is, is uh, to criticise Israel is actually anti-imperialist and we should all be encouraged to be having those kinds of criticisms. Israel continues to serve the needs of other nation states that compete for economic, military and strategic dominance. And unfortunately, the cover story of it being a safe haven for Jews is the only... Uh, uh, that, that this is the only possible way Jews in the world can be safe allows this status quo to uh, to be continued to ju to be justified, um, and what we've seen for the last seventy five years to continue without being seriously challenged. Um, so I'll end with a statement from the Jewish Council of Australia in response to the most recent massacre in Rafa, because I think it's quite telling that there's a new formal institution. Uh, alternative formal institution that's formed recently to represent Jews that are increasingly being frustrated that all the other official institutions uh, that claim to represent them are just, you know, uncritically supporting the State of Israel. So the Jewish Council of Australia said, with each passing day, it becomes clearer that Israel is a rogue state. We say this as part of a large and growing number of Jews in Australia and around the world who have been calling for a ceasefire for many months and saying that Israel's actions are completely incompatible with our Jewish values. Opposing this genocide is an expression of our Jewishness and an honouring of our ancestors who were themselves the victims of genocide and racist violence. So to say that all Jews are represented by this pariah state uh, is yeah, probably more anti-Semitic than to say that criticising Israel, or than to criticise Israel. So um, I'll leave it there and I'm happy to open it up to, to discussion.